Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Monday, June 22nd. Let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun and we look to the evening light. We sing to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me, like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me, they have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. Our New Testament reading tonight is St. John's account of the crucifixion and burial of Christ, of which Psalm 22 uh, is all about that. Beginning in John 19, 23. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness, his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled, not one of his bones will be broken. And again another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. 
Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Our Book of Concord reading is from Article 4 of the Large Catechism. This is our conclusion of, I think it's the conclusion, the conclusion of this section on baptism, beginning in paragraph 60. Therefore, let it be decided that baptism always remains true and retains its full essence. This is true even though a single person should be baptized, and he, in addition, should not truly believe. For God's ordinance and word cannot be made inconsistent or be changed by people. But these people, the fanatics, are so blind that they do not see God's word in command. They think about baptism and those who administer it, just like they think about water in the brook or in pots, or like any common person. Because they do not see faith or obedience in infants, they conclude that infant baptisms are to be considered invalid. Here lurks a concealed, rebellious devil who would like to tear the crown from authority's head and then trample it underfoot. And in addition, he would like to pervert and reduce to nothing all God's works and ordinances. Therefore, we must be watchful and well-armed, 2 Corinthians 10.4. We must not allow ourselves to be directed or turned away from the word in order that we may not think of baptism as a mere empty sign like the fanatic's dream. Lastly, we must also know that what baptism signifies and why God has ordained just this outward sign and ceremony for the sacrament by which we are first received into the Christian church. The act or ceremony is this. We are sunk under the water which passes over us and afterward are drawn out again. These two parts, to be sunk under the water and be drawn out again, signify baptism's power and work. It is nothing other than putting to death the old Adam and effecting the new man's resurrection after that. Both of these things must take place in us all our lives. So a truly Christian life is nothing other than a daily baptism, once begun and ever to be continued. For this must be done without ceasing, that we always keep purging away whatever belongs to the old Adam. Then what belongs to the new man may come forth. But what is the old man? It is what is born in human beings from Adam, anger, hate, envy, unchastity, stinginess, laziness, arrogance, yes, unbelief. The old man is infected with all vices and has by nature nothing good in him. Now when we have come into Christ's kingdom, these things must daily decrease. The longer we live, the more we become gentle, patient, meek, and ever turn away from unbelief, greed, hatred, envy, and arrogance. This is baptism's true use among Christians, as signified by baptizing with water. Therefore, where this is not done, the old man is left unbridled. He continually becomes stronger. That is not using baptism, but working against baptism. For those who are without Christ cannot help but become worse daily, just as the proverb says, which expresses the truth, worse and worse, the longer a vice lasts, the worse it gets. If a year ago someone was proud and greedy, then he is more proud and greedy this year. So the vice grows and increases with him from his youth up. A young child has no special vice, but when it grows up, it becomes unchaste and impure. When it reaches maturity, real vices begin to triumph. The longer the child lives, the more vices. Therefore, the old man goes unrestrained in his nature if he is not stopped and suppressed by baptism's power. On the other hand, where people have become Christians, the old man daily decreases until he finally perishes. That is truly being buried in baptism and daily coming forth again. Therefore, the outward sign is appointed not only for a powerful effect, but also for an illustration. Therefore, where faith flourishes with its fruit, there it has no empty meaning, but the work of mortifying the flesh goes with it. But where faith is lacking, it remains a mere unfruitful sign. Here you see that baptism, both in its power and meaning, includes also the third sacrament, which has been called repentance. It is really nothing other than baptism. What else is repentance but a serious attack on the old man that his lusts be restrained and an entering into new life? Therefore, if you live in repentance, you walk in baptism. For baptism not only illustrates such a new life, but also produces, begins, and exercises it. For in baptism are given grace, the spirit, and power to suppress the old man, so that the new man may come forth and become strong. Our baptism abides forever. Even though someone should fall from baptism in sin, still we always have access to it. 
so we may subdue the old man again. But we do not need to be sprinkled with water again. Even if we were put under the water a hundred times, it would still only be one baptism, even though the work and sign continue and remain. Repentance, therefore, is nothing other than a return and approach to baptism. We repeat and do what we began before, but abandoned. I say this lest we fall into the opinion in which we were stuck for a long time. We were imagining that our baptism is something past, which we can no longer use after we have fallen again into sin. The reason for this is that baptism is regarded as only based on the outward act once performed and completed. This arose from the fact that St. Jerome wrote that repentance is the second plank by which we must swim forth and cross over the water after the ship is broken, on which we step and are carried across when we come into the Christian church. By this teaching, baptism's use has been abolished so that it can no longer profit us. Therefore, Jerome's statement is not correct, or at any rate, is not rightly understood. For the ship of baptism never breaks, because, as we have said, it is God's ordinance and not our work. But it does happen indeed that we slip and fall out of the ship. Yet if anyone falls out, let him see to it that he swims up and clings to the ship until he comes into it again and lives in it, as he has done before. In this way one sees what a great, excellent thing baptism is. It delivers us from the devil's jaws and makes us God's own. It suppresses and takes away sin and then daily strengthens the new man. It is working and always continues working until we pass from this estate of misery to eternal glory. For this reason, let everyone value his baptism as a daily dress, Galatians 3.27, in which he is to walk constantly. Then he may ever be found in the faith and its fruit, so that he may suppress the old man and grow up in the new. For if we would be Christians, we must do the work by which we are Christians. But if anyone falls away from the Christian life, let him again come into it. For just as Christ, the mercy seat, does not draw back from us or forbid us to come to him again, even though we sin, so all his treasure and gifts also remain. Therefore, if we have received forgiveness of sin once in baptism, it will remain every day as long as we live. Baptism will remain as long as we carry the old man around our neck. And that is the end of the section on baptism. Ends rather abruptly. Tomorrow evening we will begin this section on the Lord's Supper. I think we will be in that one for uh, probably three days at least. That one's pretty long. Now we join together in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, merciful and holy Bridegroom, we grieve the fall of your church. It is our fault that the beauty of your bride is no longer recognized. Therefore, we pray you, give and increase in us faith, love, and hope in you. Root out of us all sin and vice, all strife, all disbelief, all error and heresy. Rebuke the erring, convert the unbelievers. Bring the rebellious again to the unity of the Christian church, and show them the light of your truth. Protect our shepherd from all danger of body and soul. Bless all pastors and those who administer in the church in the building of your congregation, Grant them success in all things. Equip your whole church with the power and proof of the holy faith. Stand by your witnesses among the nations and further the course of your gospel in all the world. Fill all government with the fear of you and let their ruling serve to foster and preserve peace. Have mercy on our people and our country. Let the youth be brought up in discipline and in a right knowledge of you, 
so that they may recognize your law and the way of your salvation. Give constancy and loyalty to all pious teachers. Comfort all the troubled and sorrowful. Impart health of body and soul to the sick. Grant to all pregnant women, according to your mercy, a happy result in their childbearing. To the needy, give bodily and spiritually according to your good pleasure. Let those who travel be commended to the protection of your holy angels, and be a strong help to all who need you. For the sake of your holy wounds, O Jesus. Amen. Lord Jesus, our Savior and Lord, you declared that the work of bringing in a new creation was accomplished by your declaration from the cross that it is finished. Give us eyes to see the signs of the new creation in your ongoing healing of our bodies and souls through your holy sacraments, where you continue to come to us as our Creator, who is bringing in the new creation. For you live and reign with him in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.